And Larry, we have a lot to talk about when it comes to the economy with respect to markets, but I want to start with something very different, and that is what we saw in that tragic shooting down in South Texas in that elementary school. I'd like to say it's unimaginable, except it's happened too many times. Do you have any thoughts about what we're seeing in this country? Horror, rage, frustration. We can do, be we can do better. We need to think through what the right solution is, uh, some, some limits on access to guns that don't threaten any real Second Amendment right, some red flag set of uh, procedures that cap catch uh, signs of trouble in people and uh, take actions. We just can't accept this as the regular order of business in America. And I think, David, it reflects something that may be broader, a kind of new callousness uh, in our country. We're probably only in the fifth inning with respect to uh, COVID. There are going to be hundreds of people dying each day, as far as the eye can see. And we are not, as a country, making the investments, whether it's vaccines you can take uh, through your nose, whether it's new therapeutics, whether it's a war on long uh, COVID and clinical trials that we need. We've let the COVID controversy become a green eye shade thing about pay fors and a culture thing about masks when they're the highest return investments available in our society for here and for leadership around the world. And we just can't seem to get there. And I just don't understand why we can't all come together on the proposition that innocent Americans shouldn't be dying and that it's government's first obligation in the name of security to prevent that from happening. Yeah, it's hard to imagine what's going on. Larry, let's come back now to the economy, if we could. Uh, and particularly, we had FOMC minutes coming out this week that the markets took as good news because they talked about having raising rates at 50 basis points for two or three times, and then that gives them flexibility. Has the Fed already accomplished much of what it has to accomplish with respect to inflation? I doubt it, but I'm not sure. I think the Fed's flexibility is a much better place for it to be than all this emphasis on forward guidance that we were having uh, for a long time. I think humility is the right posture in, uh, with respect to uh, monetary policy. David, as you know, my view has been that inflation's not going to come down without some meaningful downturn in our economy that means an increase in unemployment. But I've been uncertain as to where interest rates will have to go to achieve that, particularly all that's happening that's been adverse for financial conditions in the stock market and in uh, credit markets. But I thought the Fed's posture at last was uh, broadly appropriate. And now the question's going to involve uh, carrying, uh, carrying through. But I do continue to believe that a soft landing is an unlikely uh, outcome and that those who are confident that it will happen, I don't think have a basis for their confidence. Okay, well, let's talk about the Congressional Budget Office, because I don't know how confident they are, but they came out with projections this week that, that would sure look like a soft landing to me. They have inflation coming down to 2.3% by 2024. They've got GDP growth at 1.5%. Unemployment still under 4% at 3.8%. And the 10-year only goes up to 3.1%. That sounds a lot like a soft landing to me, Larry. I've always thought of the CBO as a bastion of credibility. I've watched the CBO projections for 40 years. This is their least plausible one in the 40 years uh, that I've been watching. To be fair, they have to lock that forecast up months ago, and a lot's happened that's been adverse in the last several months. But they are the last holdout on team transitory, on the conviction that somehow we can have the economy overstimulated 
and still have inflation come way down because the supply side is just going to wonderfully materialize. That's a conceivable outcome. It's a possible outcome. How they could regard that as the most likely uh, outcome is not something uh, that I can understand. You know, David, a good discipline for, would have been a good discipline for them, a good discipline that I try to use, and I would commend to your listeners, is whenever you have a forecast, imagine that it's way off on the upside and imagine that it's way off on the downside and see if those two things are equally plausible. And I, for one, don't think that 4% inflation is, I think it's much, much more plausible than 0% inflation two years from now. And that tells me that 2% inflation isn't really a best guess. One of the developments this week was how the United Kingdom is addressing some of the energy cost problems. They're imposing a 25% windfall profits tax on excess profits from oil and gas. We had Mohammed al and say, you know what, he's not sure it's a great idea, but it's better than the alternatives if they give that money to the people who are having to pay more, the, who don't uh, tend not to be the people who can afford it. What do you think about windfall profits taxes on oil and gas? I don't know about the British context, but I think in the American context, they'd be a grave, grave uh, error. Today's windfall profits tax is tomorrow is a return, is a tax on the return people made on investments that prepared for this contingency. A society that imposes windfall profits taxes is a society that discourages preparatory uh, investments. It's a mistake. If we need revenue, which we do in this country, we should get it by repealing the windfall profits giveaway that was represented in the Trump tax cuts to a substantial degree. And that would enable us also to join the world in the global tax cooperation that was such a great success for uh, Secretary Yellen. I've sometimes been critical of the Biden administration, but I applaud them for having resisted the easy political temptation to uh, windfall profits taxes. That was the courageous thing, and that was the right thing. Uh, Larry, let's talk about how we're trying to get our arms around inflation back here. We all have to talk about macroeconomics. You're a renowned macroeconomist. What about some of the microeconomics, things like antitrust policy, something we talked about last week on Wall Street Week. You tweeted about it to, to good effect this week. Uh, also, for that matter, tariffs. We continue to talk about tariffs with even Secretary of State Blinken coming out and giving a speech this week. Doesn't sound like those China tariffs are coming off anytime soon. I would say this. Those who say that vigorous competition is central to capitalism are absolutely right. We should be pushing for vigorous competition. Probably the single most important instrument the government has for promoting competition in key industries is maintaining open markets in which foreign companies have access to U.S. markets and can compete with U.S. producers, and which in return for that, U.S. producers get more access uh, to uh, foreign markets. Trade liberalization is central to having competition uh, in the economy, and it should be at the front of any kind of competition policy. If we had not had 17.5% tariffs on infant formula, we would be in a much better position with respect to that issue uh, today. If governments had more sensible procurement policies with respect to infant formula at the state level, we would be in a better position with respect to uh, infant formula uh, today. So. Yes, I applaud the administration's emphasis on competition uh, policy, but that means we've got to respect all competitors who can help American households.